it's great to have everybody here. Um, since I don't know everybody and I know we have folks joining on Facebook, my name is Michael Goldberg and I'm the executive director of our Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship and also um, am a professor at Weatherhead where I teach uh, courses on entrepreneurship. And it's great to have uh, Eric Verplug as part of our uh, CWRU Entrepreneurship Alumni Speaker Series. Sometimes we have non-alums, but we get to throw the alums in when we have our proud alums. So Eric, thank you so much for making the time to do this today. Um, Vibov, uh, who's one of our awesome um, MBA students, actually an integrated student, um, is going to be the moderator. The format for those who are joining for the first time is that these are all student moderators. So we make the students do the work, which is great. Um, so Vi Bob will moderate. If you're on Zoom or on Facebook, please go ahead if you have questions. We like these to be as interactive as possible. So put your questions um, that you might want to ask Eric uh, either in the chat or let Vi Bob know. We'd love to have you ask them directly. So if you're game for unmuting yourself and, and asking the question, that'd be great. If not, Vi Bob can ask it for you. And um, we will go from there. And I see we have a few more. Sasong and Emily are on, part of our recent grads who went out to San Francisco with us as part of our trek. It's nice to see you. And, and Rohan also, Sinha, was part of our trek. So um, welcome. And with that, um, Vi Bob, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Professor. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the CWRU Wheel Institute of uh, Entrepreneurship Speaker Series session. I'm Babur Kurana, MBA MSM Finance student at Weatherhead School. Um, today we have with us Managing Director of DTCP and Case Alum, Eric. Um, Eric is an accomplished venture capitalist with success in corporate and financial venture investment groups across all companies, uh, maturity stages within fintech, mobility, marketplace sector, entrepreneur, SaaS, etc. He's also an active investor, active angel investor, I'm sorry, in pre-series A companies. Um, before starting his venture career, Eric started two venture-backed companies and raised five rounds of funding from uh, companies such as Kleiner Perkins, Mayfield, JMI Equity, amongst others. Um, Eric completed his bachelor's in electrical engineering from Case Western Reserve and then went on to do his MBA at Stanford. Currently, he's managing director at DTCP, Dutch Telecom Capital Partners. Welcome, Eric, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, so let me start by asking you the first question. Um, can you share something about your career journey? How did you reach where you are right now? Uh, sequence of happenstance and for good fortune and bad luck. Uh, you know, I was always interested in, in the overlap of, of business and science. Um, you know, as a kid even, uh, you know, my parents were um, science type people uh, by by profession, um, which you know, sort of was a natural following in the footsteps. I don't know where the business interest originally came from, but I know my parents were supportive of that. I think more from just being supportive of me than any actual interest in their part. I think they they always thought the business was a little bit dirty, um, you know, from a pure scientist perspective. Um, but um, but I ended up at Case, you know, in uh, doing electrical engineering work, and that was the first place where. I had heard of Moore's Law, um, and I remember having, uh, maybe epiphany is an overstatement, but I remember thinking, wow, that, that's gonna keep going for a long time. Like, for the next decade or two or three, um, I should kind of hook my, my wagon up to that, that mega trend. Um, and, and maybe I was a little bit overly literal in, in saying, okay, I'm gonna do semiconductor device physics at Stanford, but, um, but I think that directionally, that was a good call, right? Like it was just getting, you know, getting onto an up escalator is you know, a, a happier, better, better place to be than in a, a shrinking industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I ended up at, uh, at Stanford. Um, I was just going to get a master's degree and then go do, you know, the high tech entrepreneurship -y stuff. Uh, but I saw that a lot of people in the Valley had, were doing, um, you know, who had PhDs were doing things that I admired. Um, and they were CEOs of companies and, and you know, partners of venture firms and just doing a lot of interesting things. And um, so I managed to, to um, uh, pass the qualifying exams to get into the PhD program and get in a great research group with the guy who ended up becoming the head of the, of the Dean of the Engineering School and really enjoyed that process. Um, and, then, uh, and then ended up getting an MBA, got into that program, focused completely on high-tech entrepreneurship, and, 
started two venture back companies, which I don't know if there's a one best path to venture, but that's a pretty good one is, you know, going through the process of actually starting a company um, is pretty good. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the key point for me happened at sort of a, a break point in the second company when there was a natural sort of change in things. And, and one, of the, one of my board members um, uh, said, hey, had you ever thought about um, a career in venture? And uh, I remember, I'm not a very tactful person, but this time I was tactful enough to not say the following thing out loud. But in my head, I thought, eh, I don't know. I'm, I still have enough fight in me. I'm not ready to retire into venture capital. I mean, that looks like a 30 hour week job if you include golf. Um, so I said, oh, that's, but I did say with my out loud voice, oh, that sounds interesting. Let, let's dig into that a bit. And, and I had a bunch of meetings with people who were in, in venture. And that's one of the advantage of, you know, coming out of Stanford is that, you know, a lot of those people mm -hmm. and, um, they disabused me of that notion that it was a 30 hour week job. Uh, and, you know, the more that I thought about it, the more I thought, well, that's, um, that is like a kind of a good fit for me. Um, and so I ended up joining Vantage Point Venture Partners, who was uh, um, who led the Series B at the second company I started. Um, and I ended up taking uh, a board seat where I was chairman of the board of the company and uh, representing Vantage Point's interests in the company. Um, and I spent eight years at Vantage Point, heading up the mobile practice there, and um, left venture for a handful of years after that. I was running a quant hedge fund um, doing uh, behavioral finance-based trading on the times when, you know, specific instances where, you know, we humans get greedy or fearful and taking the opposite side of that, um, which was a fascinating intellectual undertaking, but kind of lonely, um, and was anxious to get back into venture. Um, and so I just started doing my own venture investing for a couple of years. And then that segued naturally into the role here at Deutsche Telekom Capital Partners. Um, and I've been an MD here for three years. Great. Um, so it seems like you had a very gradual step-by-step -step sort of path. You didn't have, like you didn't graduate from college thinking, oh, I want to be a venture capitalist at the end of the day. It was more gradual. But in your experience, have you met people who've had, like what's the mix of people who go to schools and say, I just want to be a venture capitalist. Do you see that trend sort of happening with students? Um, I see that, but I, I, I think it's not a trend so much as a symptom of a long bull market um, in, in, you know, and unfortunately we're at the end of it, but, um, but we are at the end of the longest bull market of my lifetime. And um, in a long protracted bull market, um, no one can get enough venture capital, mm -hmm. right? It's super high beta equity that does fantastically well across the board in a bull market. And so it, it draws a lot of enthusiasm and, and people into it. And so to directly answer your question, yes, 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 I definitely see that. I see in the last few years that, you know, lots of people are coming straight out of, you know, MBA programs or even, you know, undergrad things like, I want to be a venture capitalist. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I, I think it's going to be tough you know, if this recession is anything other than a very short, sharp V-shaped recession, I think it'd be tough to, to do it because the industry will just shrink a bunch. Um, and in a shrinking industry, it's, it's hard to, to be a new entrant. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so you mentioned about the end of bull run and my next question is actually related to that. We're all in the COVID-19 as of now, and we know that this is not a short term, at least it doesn't, looks like it's like a short term trend or something. How has the VC funding space gotten impacted because of COVID-19? You know, I think of it in um, maybe uh, three different kind of uh, time periods, right? In, in, there's one answer if you think about it in terms of months, another in terms of quarters, and another in terms of years. And so, so let me take those in turn. I think for the first few months, you know, there are a couple obvious things. Like one of them is if you're in one of the sectors that's obviously directly impacted, like travel or hospitality or events, the, the in direct impact in the first couple of months has just been devastating. I mean, it is, there's no way to overstate how bad that is for those sectors. Um, I think outside of those sectors, um, 
it's been a little bit of a change, but you know, has been surprisingly, you know, uh, kind of business as usual. Uh, I think shifting to like thinking about the next few quarters, like the next, you know, two to eight quarters, um, it really depends on how the how bad and deep the the recession is, right? If if it is a short sharp V or is it a long deep trough? Um, and you know the officially I'm a militant agnostic when it comes to looking at the crystal ball and, and knowing which of those two it is because I don't think anybody has demonstrated an ability to predict that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But in my heart and you know. It, I'm, I'm more fearful that it's the latter, that it's going to be a long, deep trough. And if that's the case, then the impact on the venture and, and entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem um, is going to be severe. Uh, you know, it's hard to overstate. Like, um, maybe some anecdotes. Um, in the late 90s, I think there were about 50 seed stage venture funds. Um, I think one of them out of 50 survived the dot-com crash. Um, so a 98% attrition rate is pretty severe. Uh, I think if we have a deep trough that, you know, currently probably there are 300-ish seed stage venture firms. Um, I don't think we'll have 98% attrition, but 90% attrition wouldn't be a bad guess if it's a deep, deep recession. Um, and so I, I think that's the way to think about it is like it will be basically essentially impossible to start a new venture firm and that most of the, especially the early stage ones, will go out of business um, if there's a, a, a protracted recession. So that's the next, you know, handful of quarters. Mm -hmm. And then the answer, I think, when you think about it from the next, you know, in the years, honestly, I don't think it'll be that big an impact. Um, you know, for companies that are being started now or early stage investments that are being made, you know, seed and series A, the average time to liquidity is about eight years. Um, and so the chances of us looking back at 2020 when it's 2028 and going, oh my gosh, you know, if I had only known that thing, then I would be a billionaire now. I, I just don't think it'll have that kind of impact. Um, there'll be a little changes. There'll be some acceleration of sort of work from home things, but those were trends that were happening already. Um, I, I haven't seen anything that makes me go, ah, this will change how the world will be in eight years. Okay. So we have some questions coming in from the attendees. Um, Sisong, uh, do you want to ask your question? Please unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Um, and also thanks, Derek, for being here. So you brought up a really great point about this excitement to be a VC. I mean, personally, I guess, I fall victim to that where I'm like, oh, it'd be really cool to be a venture capitalist. Um, but you do bring up a good point about the future of these firms. But I was curious, like looking, reflecting back on your career, what are some of the most important lessons that young people just starting their careers should be trying to find instead of searching for this like aspirational role that may or may not be, um, Sorry, I'm losing train of thought. May or may not be like foreseeable in the next couple of years. What are some other like main skills, main lessons, just things that are really important to hold on to or walk away with during this time, whether it be finishing up school or like jumping into a new role? Um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, and I have two big pieces of advice uh, in, in that, uh, that vein. Um, the first one is um, to get a mentor. Um, and it doesn't have to be a mentor. It can be you know, a collection of folks and it can vary over time. But um, rather than trying to learn everything yourself from direct experience, um, if there's somebody who's a little bit older uh, and experienced in the industry that you're, you're interested in, um, who is willing to take time to, to give you advice, um, they've walked down that path before uh, and they are going to have insights and help you see the forest for the trees in ways that are unlikely that you would find in your first pass through the, the forest. So that's the first general piece. I think the second piece is if you really want to do like, you know, venture or high tech entrepreneurship, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe segmenting that like the things you might go do of like start your own company or join a little tiny company is, is path, you know, number one and num path number two might be, um, you know, joining a, a, a growth stage company that's, you know, well-funded and, 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 you know, models working. 
And then you know, path three might be you know, join a big, big company that's a, a public company and, and is well established. And I would make a really strong case for path number two um, for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is once they're sort of established growth stage company, they attract really the best senior management, best middle management, best individual contributors all want to come work for those companies because they're rocket ships and they're on a great path. And so rather than learning from the slowest way imaginable, which is you make your own mistake, you're like, okay, don't do that again. And then you make a new mistake, okay, don't do that. Rather than that, you're learning from people who, who executed beautifully before and were able to get into this rocket ship. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of learning that you get from joining a, a well-functioning, you know, growth stage company. Um, and plus you get sort of the brand halo and great network that comes from joining a company like that, that, you know, if you join an early stage company or you start your own, you know, you're talking like small single digit percent chance of that working. And so then you're like, wow, I made a bunch of mistakes. Okay, I learned some lessons, but I didn't make it much money from it. Um, and, you know, I don't have much of a network that comes from it. If you go to a big, big company, you know, there are, there are definitely, you know, companies that are execute well, even though they're big public companies, but by and large, you know, it's a different kind of, of people who aren't interested in entrepreneurship that end up in those companies. And so you, you get less of sort of immersion into that, that ecosystem, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Thanks a ton. Thank you. Uh, next question, Sanjeev, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I will. Um, thanks a lot for, for being here, Eric, and to all the other alumni who've taken the time to uh, share their insights. Uh, you know, my question is um, about the portfolio companies at DTCP and some of the issues that they're facing through the COVID crisis, as well as how DTCP is still focused on driving value and creating value in these companies going forward. Um, I would segment this, so thank you. So um, the, I'd segment that into sort of categories. Um, like the, the, the biggest near-term issue facing um, uh, uh, venture-backed companies in general is capital formation, right? If, if the coming quarters um, are a deep, long uh, recession, then um, it will be very difficult for even reasonably high-quality companies to raise capital. The very best will always have access to capital, you know, the top 5 percent uh, of the companies in terms of execution, um, but it will become very difficult uh, for anything other than that five, top 5 or 10 or 15 percent of companies. Um, and so that's, that's the number one piece of advice is just sort of a, an honest, you know, and like hyper honest, you know, assessment of the capital that one has uh, available. Um, and you know, being able to go for the next couple of years uh, without additional capital, um, that's the number one thing. I think you know, to your question of who, how they're impacted and how we help them, that you know, we can help them see the forest for the trees around like, oh yeah, no, it's gonna really be bad to raise capital. You know, like, if you need it you know, next year, get it now, even if it means you know, taking it on less attractive uh, valuation, take it now. Um, you know, I think the, the longer answer is it really kind of depends on the sector um, that they're in. So a company like Fastly, where we raised, you know, we, we participated in the pre-IPO round, you know, the, their capital formation part is, is kind of done and, and they're in the public markets already. And, and, and they're a huge beneficiary of, you know, work from home and internet traffic. And so like they've been doing fantastic as a public stock. Uh, you know, it's a, a mixed bag in the rest of the portfolio. Some are slightly assisted by um, the work from home acceleration. Some are noticeably hurt. Um, we have one or two companies in the old portfolio from that are in the ad tech world, and you know, ad spending is noticeably down. You know, anybody who's uh, reliant on spending from you know travel and tourism and hospitality is uh, obviously you know taken a hit in the last few months. Um, and so, but it's the same, same question, right? Like, you know, how do you make sure that you have the resources required to get to the other side of this? Um, and, you know, in some cases, like it's kind of business as usual. In other cases, it's having to really focus on the core of the business that's gonna be exciting in two years 
and you know not indulging in the luxury of spending on some of the things that that you know are a good idea that you wish you could spend on but you just don't have the resources to do yeah thanks a lot appreciate it um eric so a question based on that as um have you seen any impact on the proposals pipeline that VCs usually see on an average? Is there a dip in that? Um, like, are you seeing any trend around that? Um, it's a multi-level answer to that question. I mean, um, so maybe let's take the most positive um, answer to that. Um, so there are companies that are high quality companies that we've met with in the past uh, couple of years that we couldn't get access to. Um, we weren't able to talk our way in, the round was oversubscribed, you know, whatever, whatever the, the, the reason that we really wish we could have been able to do. So in March, uh, when this was, you know, you know uh, COVID was starting to, to make people panic and uh, Sequoia had sent out there, you know, sort of like end of days, you know, email to their uh, CEOs. And I, you know, it's good advice, right? I was on a board with one of the Sequoia guys and, you know, he's like, uh, you know, walk through the rationale in, in a board meeting, and you know, it is good advice. Um, and it creates sort of a, a, an opportunity for, um, you know, getting access to uh, companies that you might, or as might not be able to get to. So we reached out to those, those handful of companies, and, you know, um, it hasn't been announced yet, so I can't name the company, but super high quality company that we couldn't have gotten access to last year. Uh, we're going to be putting a $10 million investment into as part of a round um, right now. Um, so that was one thing that we did. I think from the, the pipeline perspective, we saw sort of that wave, right? If everyone was getting that advice from their board of like, well, if you were thinking about raising, you know, um, anytime in the next 12 to 18 months, now would be a good time to accelerate those plans. Uh, that was the great companies, the middling companies, and the crummy, you know, uh, barely alive companies as well. Um, they all did that. Uh, so there was a bit of a wave in, in, in March of that. Um, that's kind of played out. Um, what I see in the ecosystem now is um, the very best venture firms are continuing business as usual and focused on their their plan and path and their normal you know, strategy and their normal deal cadence. Um, and that the second, second, well, I'd say the third tier, right? The, like the bottom half venture firms um, are saying, whoa, we need to slow down. We need to, we, we need to husband our cash. We need to like, maybe, you know, we'll see multiple compression here in the coming um, quarters and we can get, you know, good prices. And in the back of their head, they're also thinking, maybe we can't fundraise for the next fund on the timeline we were thinking, and maybe we should stretch this one out a little bit longer. So I think those are the main dynamics we're seeing. I, you know, I, there's a, I, I don't know, this is, a, this is my own uh, observation that is, you know, my opinion. I, don't, I wouldn't take this as venture gospel, but uh, I've seen an increase, especially in, in my, um, my personal seed stage investing, everybody's jammed the word COVID into their fundraising presentation, uh, which I just, I mean, I understand that they, you know, people want to talk about that and so, okay. But I, I think that's just a way overplayed given the fact that it, we're eight years from exit for, for these companies. Okay. Um, we have a question from Jay. Do you want, Jay, do you want to unmute and ask the question? Yeah, uh, first of all, Eric, thank you for being here. Um, so this is sort of an extension of, I guess, Sasong's previous question. Um, so I was actually, to give context, one of the, uh, the undergrads that entered venture uh, at a relatively early age. Um, and candidly speaking, a lot of that was due to the allure of the term itself. Um, but what I had realized um, after, you know, having some work experience there was that had I had uh, previous experience uh, out of startup, sort of some operator experience, it would have better prepared me for that role. So um, if you could speak of, upon uh, basically the skills that you had learned as a founder and uh, basically what, how those skills are transferable, I would really appreciate that. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's a good path. There's a, a right path. I think everyone, you know, finds their way as best they can through the world. 
Um, and you look at the people who are the very best venture investors, some of them really have done nothing other than venture their entire lives. Um, and honestly, like if you, if you were to say, you know, what's the fastest, best way to learn venture? I guess I would say it's do venture. And if you have the opportunity to do it, then, and that's what you want to do, there's really no, no better path. Um, for learning it. And it, it is an apprenticeship craft. And so, you know, if you can do it in a place where you are working with great venture investors, there, there's no better way to do it. Um, there aren't that many really great venture investors, though. And so doing it with okay venture investors who made money some other place and are coming to do venture because they have money or have access to money you know, I'm not sure you're going to learn much there. Um, that really helps you in the fullness of time. Um, like, you know, you think of some of the very best venture investors in, in the world in terms of performance, they come from a really broad set of backgrounds. Um, so, to, but to answer your question on like what I feel like I bring, you know, and, and what was useful from founding a couple of, of venture back companies, um, a couple of things. One of them is around sort of empathy with the founders and, and, and recognizing um, the difficulty of the journey. Um, and, that, and that appreciation of sort of, um, I forget whose quote this is, but there's somebody, somebody got a great quote, right? Like, um, the rational person looks at the world as it is and says, okay, how do I make my way through the world as it is to my best advantage? And the irrational person looks at the world and says, Meh, it shouldn't be like that. I'm going to change it. And that's the entrepreneur, right? And, and you know, the, the positive spin on it is like all forward progress in society requires the behavior of the irrational person. Um, I have experienced, and I say this lovingly having started to venture back companies, that a lot of people who start companies, like that irrationalism is closely correlate, correlated with like just flat out craziness um, in a loving sort of way, um, sometimes too far and, you know, in a, in a crazy, you know, can't, can't, uh, can't work with them away. But it, but it takes a special kind of, of person to, you know, focus on that, that world and, um, and take on that, that daunting chat task of changing the world as it is. So I think that's part of it. I think, um, and the reason why that's useful like if you think about the sequence of what we do as venture investors of sort of, and I'm gonna do this sort of chronologically and then talk about importance, like you see opportunities, you select opportunities, you, you know, win opportunities if it's a competitive deal situation, you work with those companies you know, to help them be successful and then you help them exit, right? those five sequences in time. And everyone in venture talks about, you know, like there's so much focus on the selection process and the working with the company's process. And it's like, you know, people will talk about that at great length, but in terms of driving success in venture, those are not the most important parts. The most important parts are winning access to the very best companies when there are multiple deals, term sheets on the table, and seeing the very best companies. Um, you know, you and I, we can start Jay and Eric Venture Co. and say, let's do, you know, growth stage investing. You know, we found a rich uncle who give us, you know, few hundred million bucks and we're going to start making investments. And we're like, okay, great. Let's invest in HashiCorp, Snowflake, Carta, Databricks, Airtable, and Confluent. Let's do those. Like, done. Right? We've just selected. I can guarantee you those are okay companies. But you and I couldn't get access. We could not get access. We could not, no matter how much we want to, we can't make those investments happen because A, we wouldn't even be able to see them. Maybe we can see them. I can, you know, I can get a meeting. But like we wouldn't be able to access them. They would do around it like they just wouldn't take our check. And so to success in venture is about building how can we get access to the very best companies. That's the hard one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rohan, you want to ask the next question? Yeah, thank you. Um, so Eric, as I understand, you're involved currently in the corporate VC space, which is a little bit different from, you know, your conventional VC thesis. So this is kind of a two-parter. So number one is why did you opt to get involved with a corporate VC fund and go with that model? And related to that, what special challenges have you encountered given that you have a responsibility to a parent company as opposed to just a particular set of investors or partners? That's a fantastic question. Um, so, uh, 
there are so many different kinds of corporate venture capital groups. Um, most of them, maybe 80 plus percent, would be in the category that I would call strategic, where the, the host uh, company tells the venture team what to do. And there are lots of different ways that the host company can tell the venture team what to do. Um, a few of them are, are rational, good strategies that help move the, the, the business forward. A majority of that 80%, honestly, are, are I'm going to be a little bit, a little bit of hyperbole, but to make like a visual point, worse than taking that cash and putting it in the parking lot and setting it on fire. I mean, they're just, just can't, they don't help the parent company. They damage the brand. I mean, honestly, you'd just be better off throwing the money away than doing what they do in a lot of cases. Um, but, but I don't want to throw every strategic venture group into to that that now you like there are definitely some where they do it in a way that really helps the, the company but most of the time not then maybe 10 20 percent of them are sort of financial first um uh, venture groups and that's how deutsche telecom capital partners is set up so for uh the the investors in the group we have the same kind of fund structure as any other pure financial investor with you know carry and, and management fee and all that, um, the the part that is interesting and good um, is that it is a differentiating uh, approach. Um, and so back to this this answer to, to Jay's question, right? Like so, if we if we formed Jay Rohan and Eric Venture Company, and we said let's go make our first investment in HashiCorp and, or Snowflake, you know, I know people at those companies. Maybe I could get a meeting. But there's no way they would take our check. But if we get that meeting, and then I turn around and say, let me introduce you to the head of data warehousing business in T-Systems, who has a chance to move $50 million a, a year of your product through Europe. And then that meeting goes well, and they do initial proof of concept, and something's happening. Like, no deal is signed, but like something's happening. And it happened because of the introduction that we made to that group within Deutsche Telekom. When that next round happens, and you know um, the the big you know two hundred million dollar check is coming, and we're saying, can we please please sneak in our twenty million dollar tiny check alongside them? If it's just Rohan, Jay, and Eric, the answer is, oh, you know, we love you guys, you're super great, but no, the league won't have it. But if we're not helping make big chunk of business happened for the business, for the, for the company at like Snowflake or HashiCorp, then we have more than a fighting chance to sneak our $20 million check into their $250 million round. And so that's what's exciting about a corporate venture capital group for the venture investor. And then I, like I'm a huge believer in the power of this model because Deutsche Telekom had a strategic venture group for a couple of decades. And they made a few, like some good investments, some terrible ones. It wasn't like they were misinformed or didn't have a good team. It's just that that structure of having the corporate tell the venture team what to invest in is putting the cart in front of the horse. And it's a cart run by people who, uh, like, you know, like taking the, the innovator's dilemma approach, the very things that make them really good at doing their job um, disqualify them from making good venture uh, investment decisions, almost, almost by definition. And so you have people who are well-intentioned and trying to drive the business forward, but they make the wrong choice for the wrong reasons because they don't know how venture works. And so by having a group that is financially driven and saying, look, we're going we're gonna to decide on a fund-by-fund fund basis whether we're happy with what you're doing there at Deutsche Telekom Capital Partners. Then not every single investment has to do a deal with DT, but if half of them do, and they're the leaders in their categories, that's 100 times better for DT than if they had you know, 90% of their companies working with DT, but they were in the second or third or fourth tier players because they couldn't get access given the old model. And so I'm a huge believer in that alignment of incentives favors Deutsche Telekom and, and the few enlightened corporations that have set up these sort of financially driven venture groups much better than the command and control model 
because the very things that make them good at their day job in, in running those companies um, are directly antagonistic to making good venture decisions. Thank you. Uh, we have a next question from Klo. She writes, historically, lots of VC activity has been concentrated in the Bay Area in their own backyard. But with COVID, I can see some startups moving away. How has the virus changed you, how you invest, if at all? And going forward, is it feasible to conduct deals 100% virtually? Um, so let me take the last part uh, first. Um, so yes, I have made angel investments in companies that I have only met um, by video. Um, that is possible. Um, I, I, you know, I would not do that for uh, a ten million dollar check. Uh, that that's you know that's a different, completely different kind of thing. Well, especially when you have an obligation to a broader set of LPs and. You know, you don't want to make a mistake or like seem reckless. I think that, you know, that, that's a tougher one. And especially if you're doing it at a stage where, or part of your investment thesis is about assessing the team, it's hard to assess the team over video. Um, you get some read, but it's nowhere near as, as high fidelity as if you could meet in person. Mm -hmm. um, but the first, so, so then the first part of the question around, hey, will that um, level the geographic playing field? Will we see a reduction in the concentration of venture activity away from the Bay Area? Um, you know, 10 years ago, I predicted that that would happen. Um, I predicted that with the, the prevalence of information flowing on, you know, via the internet, that uh, we would see a leveling, a geographic leveling of the playing field, that places like Cleveland, Ohio could be just as fine and viable a place because you could get all the advice and and knowledge and learnings that, that you needed to get, uh, you know, sitting in Cleveland, Ohio, as you could sitting in Palo Alto, California. Um, and I was totally wrong. Uh, the last decade has seen an increase in concentration of the very best companies being in the Silicon Valley area. Um, there are a lot of theories behind it, but the, but the, the, the empirical data, um, refutes my initial hypothesis around uh, a geographic leveling of the playing field. And so I don't, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against that data, um, especially after I've been wrong once um, for the next decade. I don't, I don't, I don't think uh, COVID is gonna change things much. Um, and the things that would change it were the same things that I thought would level the playing field in the last decade. It just didn't happen. The data doesn't show it. Um, so Susan Nichols on Facebook asks, do you see greater opportunity as a venture capitalist now with the lack of people willing to give capital? Um, well, that gets to the, the answer from before around the companies that we couldn't get into and us going back to them and getting into one that is an absolutely fantastic company. So yes, yes. But I think also that there's everyone rushed to go raise money. Um, and so there's a, you know, it depends a little bit on how the recovery looks, right? If, if this is a short, sharp V, um, then, you know, it would be fantastic that we got into that company. Um, and, you know, any capital you deploy, it might probably do okay on average. If it is a deep, long trough, then, then it's a falling knife to invest now. And, um, and I think that's, um, that's you know driving things. I think I see a segmentation in the venture ecosystem that the very very best venture firms are continuing business as usual and continue to deploy capital at their usual pace. And you know the tier twos who are fearful of raising money in their next fund, they're not. Um, see song, you want to go next? Yeah, thanks again. Hi. Second question. So just with the recent protests and kind of the rise of corporations making a stand against racial injustice to varying degrees, I was just curious about your thoughts regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion within venture capital. Um, I just started working in sales at Google and like they're spending a lot of time just setting us aside to learn about what's going on and like the context of it. But I was just curious, like as a managing director, what kinds of conversations are you having with people within your network and how will this change the way you all might go about seeking companies or how you approach mentorship? And I know it's still 
kind of early and you might be still working through all of this. So, but I was just wondering. So I think there are um, huge fundamental problems in our society. Um, so, you know, my own personal experience, I was um, uh, bust into a historically black high school for high school uh, for, for my years there. And um, I had come from a totally really white, you know, like I'd seen maybe two black people in my life before, before that. Um, okay, that's an exaggeration. But it like, just was not part of my, my regular uh, mailing view. And it was shocking to me um, that, that sort of the ingrained racism um, and the, the, the self-fulfilling prophecy that comes from that and what it does to a human being who kind of like, fuck, like what am I gonna do, right? I'm, I'm in a, a system where um, the deck is stacked against me from the beginning. And, and so whenever I think about you know, racial injustice and, and or even you know, other, other kinds of injustice in the world, um, whether it's you know, gender or race or you know, anything, I think about the, the front of the pipeline and, and you know, for, for people to end up in positions where like they're an MD at a venture firm, um, you know, there has to be the big front of the pipeline to drive and enable that, right? Like it has to be the case that they want to be successful in school. Not that they have a hopeless view of it. It has to be the case that we're, we're encouraging them to do that. But if we think about like um, uh, equity, um, um, uh, equity in the, in the gender side, like it's maddening to me that none of my daughters wants to be in the computer science class. So none of them want to be in the after school computer science club. You know, and they're like, eh, dad, that's just a bunch of weird boys in there. Like they're not even the cool kids. And so that just, that makes me sad, right? Because the front of the funnel is where you, um, you change society and you get everyone thinking that that's the way the world should be and how it can be. So that, that's where most of my thinking and, and you know, and points is, um, they're big, hard issues. Okay, uh, Professor, do you wanna ask a question? Sure. Uh, Thanks, Bye, Bob. Um, so quick question, just as a follow-up, um, and Sasong is working for Google, but sitting in Cincinnati, I think, at her parents' house. Is that where you are remotely? I'm actually in Chicago, so. Oh, you are? You're actually in the locate. Okay, so many of our students right now, I mean, Jay is in Akron, um, working in San Francisco. So the new distributed model, we actually had Eric Bain, um, who grew up in Cleveland, went to Cleveland Heights High School, who was the former CEO of Twitter, and we were talking with him last week in this series about um, remote work. Uh, and I'm curious from an investor perspective, as you think about um, not only deploying capital in companies that may sit in other parts of the country besides the Bay Area, I'm sort of curious about what, what maybe this period has been right now or even going forward about how enthusiastic might you be to invest in a company that has a distributed workforce? Um. I think the answer is I don't care. Um, you know, at the growth stage, um, the, the performance is in the numbers. And, um, you know, maybe as a second order of concern, right, if, if, the, if, if the, the company is so distributed that I'm concerned about their ability to scale in some place or um, their ability to manage complexity as they grow, maybe. But, but when you're talking about a company that has 20 million of revenue and you can look at their operating metrics and say, well, okay, for every million dollars of sales and marketing spend, they produce a you know, uh, million dollars of new ARR with 80% gross margin. I think that's an annuity I like to spend money on. Um, and I'm happy to finance that anytime. How they get there, you know, we're gonna look at and you know, maybe it'll raise some flags or concern. But it's not going to be the primary filter, right? The, you know, if you look at like the, the eight M's of venture and, you know, like, like the checklist of things that you think through, um, you know, that kind of issue is pretty far down the list. Uh, and you're much more focused on like, you know, their operating metrics, the size of the market they're chasing after, their competitive position in the market. You know, like all of those things are much higher order concerns than, um, 
you know, scalability of the, of the team or ability to manage a remote workforce. Um, now, when it comes to my own personal angel investing, um, I wouldn't say I have an absolute rule that they have to all be in the same room, but it would be harder for me to get excited about a team that was distributed, in part because like, is this a hobby or are they really doing it? You know, like you really don't care enough to like go be in the same place. You know, you know there's gonna be some benefits and you know that um, most companies fail. And so here's a team that has voted with their feet that they're not willing to take on the thing that will probably help them. Uh, you know, if for, for that stage of investment, then I'm a little more concerned. Thanks, sir. All right, so as we almost inch towards the R, um, I have one last question. Um, so every crisis leads to pain and suffering, but after every crisis, there are some lessons learned or some events that happen that change that sector forever. Uh, for example, for 2008 financial crisis, we had more stringent capital adequacy requirements that were imposed upon the banks. Do you think something similar is coming for the VC uh, space as well? Um, <laughs> I think that's a fantastic question. Uh, I wish I had a fantastic answer. Uh, and, and by fantastic, I mean, well, may, like, maybe, maybe the useful, most valuable thing would be like, what would be a fantastic answer to that kind of question? Like a, a fantastic answer to that question would, um, be, would be right, right? Like you make a prediction about the future and you'd be right, right? Like, okay, that's obvious. Um, the second part is um, that it would be actionable mm -hmm. from a venture investment perspective. Um, that, um, that uh, you know, you might say, oh, I think there's going to be more legislation around, you know, category XYZ. And I go, okay, well, what venture investment do you make? Like, I'm going to go invest in a compliance company? Like, okay, they're, maybe they're, they're capital efficiency is going to go from 0.5 to 0.6 because of this, but it's not going to be like a huge game changer. Is that a game changer for them? Eh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Probably, probably not. So like, that's the second part. It's like, is, is the prediction actionable with respect to a venture investment? And then the third part, I think, this is the hardest part for a fantastic answer is, is it a unique insight? Mm -hmm. um, that, um, that like if you did a two by two payoff matrix um, where the columns are states of nature in the future and um, one of them was your prediction was right and the other one was your prediction was wrong. And like, of course there's shades of gray. But for this simply, it's I guess you gotta bifurcate the world into yet yeah, right or wrong. And then, and then the two rows are um, states of nature today, which is your opinion is unique. Um, and then the other one is, you know, it's the consensus view that everybody would agree to. Agree to. Um, of course, if, you know, if it proves that you were wrong, well, then your investment was a failure, right? Like that, that's a bad comment no matter what. So if that state of nature in the future proves to be, you know, antagonistic to your opinion, then you made a mistake and you lose your money. But in the good column of like your prediction was right and you predicted the state of nature in the future correctly, but it was what everybody agreed on then it's a consensus investment that everybody's plowing their money into and they're bidding the price up to the efficient frontier. And because the adventure folks are plowing their money into it and bidding the price up to the efficient frontier, every entrepreneur whose business isn't working very well is thinking about how can they pivot into this thing that's attracting all this magic money from venture idiots. And so, so then you end up with more competition jammed into that box. So even if that box pretend, you know, turns out to be true in the future, it's hard to make a venture return. Mm -hmm. So to make a venture return, you need to be in that good column of predict the future correctly, but be non-consensus in that prediction. So that's, that's like the, the, the hard part of that fantastic answer to your question. So, you know, we can make a prediction about the future, um, it has to be actionable with respect to investment, and it has to be kind of unique. It cannot be a unique a consensus one. And so if I had that view, what I would do is I would make my investment. Once I made that investment, I wouldn't tell anybody about my unique view until I made the investment. Then I would come on panels like this 
and across the blogosphere, and I would tell everyone about how compelling this view was, so that you idiots would all come pile into the next round and bid my price up in the next round. <laughs> and that's basically how the Gardner hype cycle works, um, time and time and time again. Yeah. So Sequoia and Benchmark and you know the people who are really good at this, they make an initial investment in a category, and then they talk the heck out of those companies so that all the follow people who are chatting, you know, listening to their Twitter feed and blah, 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 they're sort of the, the legal suckers uh, who are talked into marking up the next round. That's a little extreme. I'm using some hyper. <laughs> no, thank you so much. And I think that's a wrap. So I will just say thank you so much for joining and back to you, Professor. Great. Thanks, bye, Bob. Eric, thank you so much. This is a great conversation. Um, I'm not going to brown nose. Everybody was on a few of my, because of some new friends, a few of my favorite students and old students, including a few folks like Rohan and Sanjeev and Jay that have had gotten a little taste through internships um, in the space. So this is great. It's really timely. It's so awesome to have folks like you that that were uh, students at Case and connected back to the university. And I know you've been a great resource in other classes as well. So Eric, thank you so much for staying connected to us. And hopefully when the, the travel period starts again, um, there are a number of the students that went with me this past fall out on a trip to San Francisco and knock on wood, we hope to be back in the Bay Area with some students again this coming year. Love to see you, be great. Awesome. Just a couple of quick announcements um, while I have folks. First of all, we'll be back with our speaker series on Friday. We're actually branching out into a new, uh, new entrepreneurial area. We're going to talk about the world of dentistry. So um, we've got uh, medicine alums, uh, Margaret Richards Frankel, um, and Jay Rosenthal and are going to be in conversation with one of our alums talking about the dynamics of of, uh, of dentistry and, and things that are changing, particularly with, with the COVID crisis. So that'll be Friday at one o'clock. Um, also, I believe Elizabeth is going to put a link. Today is actually the day of giving at Case. And one of the beneficiary um, areas for the day of giving is actually a program that we're involved with, with the Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship. And actually several of the students. So I know Lori, Nicholas, um, uh, Rohan and who else is on my little Hollywood squares here at least there are a few folks that are all in this remote entrepreneurship program so we're funding them with $500 of support for the university to work on entrepreneurship programs so gifts that are made today would go directly to support that program we have about 110 students right now that are working on a variety of entrepreneurship projects both in in Northeast Ohio and, and around the country and the world so um, for those that are interested, Elizabeth will put a link um, there and on Facebook. Um, and with that, again, let me thank Vi Bob. Awesome job moderating today. And Eric, thank you again for taking the time and look forward to seeing everybody back on a future speaker series event.